of the Prophet وسلم, an extremely important incident and that's this what that was غزوة بني المصطلق and uh, on the way back we said there was an incident where Aisha رضي الله عنها stayed behind the army they didn't realize she was missing so she waited for them then one of the companions was and some historians say this was a habit from the Prophet وسلم, that he would leave one person behind the army just in case something happens just in case maybe an army is behind them or is chasing after them so he would be able to see what's happening so a means of protection so Saf this uh, companion was Safwan ibn Mu'attil he came he found Aisha radiallahu anha in the same place the army had been camping uh, in so when he saw her he was surprised uh, he offered her his camel and he went away for her to mount the camel without him watching that's obviously shows respect then he takes the camel by he brings it to where the Muslim army camped next among the Muslim army were the hypocrites were the hypocrites and the leader of these hypocrites the most influential among them was Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul really had a huge grudge with the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with the Muslims in general previously so there was a background to this prior to Hijrah we said Al-Aws and Al-Khazraj had a huge dispute among them, a constant war among them and uh, just prior to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam making Hijrah to Medina they had agreed on Abdullah ibn Ubayy ibn Salul to become the leader of Medina the, actually the king they were going to create a new position called king Arabs didn't have much of this. They had a leader of a tribe. They did not appoint kings. K you know, kings, heads of state, that was more in other places like Abyssinia. There was more civilization there. Uh, among the Romans and the Byzantines and among the Persians. The Arabs were more of a tribal society, so they had leaders, chiefs of tribes. So they agreed to appoint him as a king. They wanted to crown him as a king thinking that his leadership might bring about harmony among uh, the, uh, the two uh, tribes, Al-Aws and Al-Khazraj. But the arrival of the Prophet ﷺ in Medina and the fact that a good number, a fair number of the people of, of Medina have already accepted Islam, really uh, got this whole plan to be cancelled and people just turned away from this, from this thing. So he held a grudge against the Messenger ﷺ. This actually shows us that sometimes people op oppose the truth for personal reasons. Sometimes people oppose the truth for personal reasons. A lot of the enemies of Islam in, in Mecca, those who showed enmity to Islam early, earlier on in Mecca, they did that for fear of financial loss, uh, loss of control over Mecca, and other, other personal gains. So we could see oftentimes people make the wrong choice with regards to the truth for personal reasons, for personal reasons. And sometimes we, we compromise on aspects of our religion for that. Sometimes we compromise, not necessarily on Islam in its entirety, but on certain aspects in Islam due to personal reasons, personal gains. So, and we mentioned previously the father of Anas bin Malik, Anas bin Malik radiallahu anhu, his father, he decided to leave Medina and leave the Muslims altogether and he uh, traveled to Asham where he settled down there and he died as a non-Muslim because he sensed that the Prophet ﷺ was on the way to make alcohol haram and he said I'm so attached to drinking that I can't live without it. So a lesson we take from here is that we, we need to keep ourselves in check. We need to keep ourselves in check sometimes a simple desire could grow within you and push you away from making the right choices. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ says in a hadith, Al Ma'asi Baridul Kufr. He says the Ma'asi, the sins, could actually be the stepping stones to complete disbelief. To complete disbelief. And how often that happens? How often that happens? There's a story that's mentioned in the books of history uh, about. A person who was very righteous and who was a learned person 
He was traveling with the Muslims, and I'm not sure what was that, probably a trade caravan. And they were, they were actually traveling in a land of non-Muslims. It was a Christian country or something. And he saw a woman and he fell in love with her. He just, like, she, he fell, upon first sight, he just fell in love with her. And he wanted her so badly. S to the point that he went and spoke to her directly and said, I want to marry you. She said, you can't, I mean, obviously you can't because you're a Muslim and I'm a Christian. And I can't marry you as long as you so he goes and speaks to her father. Her father was a priest. And he said, I can't marry you to my daughter. You, you have to be a Christian. He said, I'll be a Christian then. And this story is well known in, uh, I mean, in some of the books of history of Islam. And he actually uh, uh, gives up Islam. He leaves Islam for the sake of that woman. <laughs> for the sake of that woman. And the story goes that a person met him years later years later and he ended up a person who takes care of pigs he takes care of pigs that was his job <coughs> that was his he ended up doing this and he got married to that girl and when he saw him he recognized him he said what happened to you he said that's it here you see me just looking after pigs so he said, do you remember anything from the Qur'an? There's a person who had memorized the Qur'an. He said, the only thing that stays with me from the Qur'an is one verse. And this was, Perhaps, those who have chosen disbelief, probably, at some level, they wish that they were Muslims. <laughs> because that's actually true. That's actually true. There's a fitrah inside everyone that seeks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that seeks the truth and recognizes it. But sometimes the desire takes over and the will the connections take over. So this is just a message for us to keep ourselves in check. Don't get carried away with your desires. And when you see a conflict between your obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and between a person uh, uh, and a personal interest, you know, you need to make the right choices. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns us against the footsteps of shaitan. Shaitan doesn't take you directly to kufr. Shaitan takes you actually one step at a time in a, in a gradual process. So this was the case. A personal gain of, uh, by Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul made him do one of the worst decisions ever and give the worst examples, one of the worst examples ever in the history of humanity. Not only like leaving Islam or not becoming a Muslim, but pretending to be a Muslim while hiding his disbelief. So this is how he lived his life. So he sees this incident, Aisha radiallahu anha is coming with Safwan al-Mu'attal. And the thing is he, and he's, he's, he was an extremely intelligent person. What does he say? He doesn't make a clear accusation. He doesn't make a clear accusation. He says a man and a woman by themselves, they must have done something. And that's it. He left it at that. And he, he kept saying this to his friends, to his circle, started spreading around. He never made a blatant accusation. He never made a blatant accusation. And what is, what this is called in Arabic, at-ta'rid. At-ta'rid, in English, insinuation. Insinuation, you don't say anything directly. You don't say it squarely. You don't, uh, like, you're just implying something. You are? implying something okay so the message is between the lines it's not direct that's what he did he played very safe but he spread that around he spread it around he got his message across so people started speaking about it mainly the hypocrites but also some good muslims fell into that some muslims fell into that and that's what we spoke about last week so the news got carried it spread around. Aisha radiallahu anha was completely heedless. The Prophet didn't know at the beginning about it. When they arrived in Medina, um, uh, Aisha became ill. She went to the, her parents' house. The Prophet later on, he received the news. And he, the Prophet felt shocked and baffled. How could like, somebody I mean, create that kind of accusation? He knows his wife. He knows that companion very well. And some of the companions, like Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu anhu, when, when he received the news, he was shocked. He was shocked. Even his wife, 
She says to him, have you heard about the news? He said, yes. I mean, it reached me, the rumors that were spreading around. It reached me. She said, what do you think? He says, like, Aisha radiallahu anha is better than you. <laughs> Safwan al-Mu'attal, that companion is better than me. What do you think I'm going to th I'm, I'm think about that? He said, absolutely, this is baseless. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praised this in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praised this in the Quran. Allah teaches us here a lesson. We said today we're going to take lessons from that story because we explained it last week in detail. Now is the time to take lessons because that's important for the uh, unity of society, for, to, for having a healthy kind of community. These things are important practices because you could destroy a society or a community just by words. Just by words. It is possible. And sometimes people say, oh, these are just words. I mean, words are probably the most profound. The most profound. So look at this beautiful attitude. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَلَوْلَا إِذْ سَمِعْتُمُوهُ ظَنَّ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتُ بِأَنفُسِهِمْ خَيْرًا He said, you guys, when you heard it, the true believers, they thought well of their fellow believers. They thought well of their fellow believers. And specifically, this is manifest in the attitude of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari. Upon hearing the rumors, straight away, he didn't even have any doubts about Aisha radiallahu anha or about Safwan ibn Mu'attir radiallahu anhu. No doubts about that at all. He completely dismissed it as untrue, as his false rumors, straight away. Where does this come from? It comes from belief. It comes from belief. Because belief... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَةً Belief is not something you just have in your heart, but it reflects on your attitude. How does it reflect on your attitude? Straight away, it makes you create good assumptions about your fellow brothers and sisters. Straight away. Straight away. And this is why the scholars say, they have a famous statement that says, الْمُؤْمِنُونَ عَذَّارُونَ وَالْمُنَافِقُونَ عَذَّارُونَ There's one difference between عَذَّارُونَ and عَذَّارُونَ they're very similar words, but there's one letter that is different. Adharun and Atharun. Adharun, the believers are Adharun. Believers are, so, are people who find excuses. They find excuses for others. Like um, a brother wrongs you so, so in, in some shape or form. Or they're late for an appointment. Or they said something about you. What do you do? You find an excuse for them. You find an excuse for them. You always give them the benefit of the doubt. That's part of faith. That's a sign of Iman. It's a sign of Iman. Whereas the hypocrites, they always interpret things in the worst possible way. They always find the worst interpretation possible for what happened. Like you, you were, one day you were upset and somehow they gave you salam, you didn't respond or you gave them that face. Straight away they're going to assume you have this, you have that. Probably they're, they're going to come up with a story that's actually the worst possible scenario. This is a sign of hypocrisy, but a sign of Iman is that you give people the benefit of the doubt. That doesn't mean you're naive, it doesn't mean you're stupid, but it means you always give the benefit of the doubt. And this actually helps a lot. This is why you see faith is actually helpful in relationships. In marriage, in marriage, usually what creates problems between husband and wife? Misunderstandings. What's a misunderstanding? You have two different point of views on the same thing. You have a different interpretation of the same situation. Like you say, you, your wife one day, she just doesn't feel well. And somehow you ask her for something, you ask her a question, and the way she responds to you, she's out of, speaking from pain, from struggle, maybe something is going through her mind, maybe she's just having a hard time coping with something, and you don't even know about her struggle, and she just responds in a way you feel is inappropriate. And maybe it's, inapp in, it's inappropriate, and you take offense. And you start what? Recalling incidents, or oh, she wasn't respectful during that day. She wasn't respectful with that situation. She must have had this or that. You start making links, and in a cascade of negative thoughts and what we call su'adhan, evil suspicion, it builds up to a point where you actually find yourself have an attitude. And it could end up in a huge dispute and maybe even destroys the marriage. Sometimes marriages are destroyed, houses are destroyed for simple reasons like this. Why? Because we don't have enough Iman to give people the benefit of the doubt. And by the way, this is a very, there's one aspect of Islam that is overlooked and it's called at-taghafl. 
The Prophet you know what the Prophet is explain his talk about his relationship with Aisha radiallahu anha. That's his wife. Who is this? The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Yarhamukallah. And when the companions spoke with him, the companions would say, Wallahi, when we spoke to the Prophet, we could not put our eyes up. We could not stare at him directly out of respect and awe to him. Some of the companions said, Wallahi, ma shabi'na min Rasulillah wala wada'tu ayni fi ayni, hayaan minhu. Some of the companions would say, I never got enough of the sight of the Prophet, just seeing him. And I never put, I never looked him eye to eye out of respect for him. His wife sometimes had issues with him. So the Prophet ﷺ in one uh, narration, he basically says to Aisha, he's actually like speaking to her in a very friendly fashion. He says, Wallahi, I know, I know when you're happy with me and when you're displeased with me. That's the Prophet ﷺ speaking to Aisha. He says, Wallahi, inni la a'lamu idha kunti radiyatan anni aw ghadibatan minni. I know. When you're upset with me, I know when you're happy with me. She says, how? He says, when you're happy with me, when you say by Allah, you say by the Lord of Muhammad, Rabbi Muhammad. But when you're upset with me, you say Rabbi Ibrahim, by the Lord of Ibrahim. The Prophet knows about this. There's a narration as well, that Abu Bakr one day came to the house of the Prophet he was about to knock on the door of the house of Aisha. About then to knock on the door, and he overhears Aisha radiallahu anha raising her voice on the Prophet sallallahu Abu Bakr gets upset. When he gets permission, he goes in and he tells Aisha off. The Prophet sallallahu says, you know, take it easy. I'm going to protect her. I mean, I mean, this narration, by the way, is disputed by scholars of hadith. Some of them consider it to be weak, weak but some of them consider it to be okay and acceptable. So it's to the point where Abu Bakr anhu wants to physically smack Aisha. But the Prophet ﷺ stands between them and he sort of uh, like uh, separates them. Then the Prophet ﷺ says to Aisha, أَرَأَيْتِ كَيْفَ أَنِّي قَدْ حَمَيْتُكِ مِنَ الرَّجُلِ Ab, You see how he protected you from the man? Like your father. And that's the Prophet ﷺ with his wives. So... Having good suspicion of people is actually a good sign, a good sign, but not to the point of naivety. So, but a hypocrite would always assume the worst of what you say, of what you do. Always assume the worst, always assume the worst. And we could sometimes assume the worst of a person. If it happens once, twice, not a big deal. But if it's consistent, that's where the problem is. It's a sign of something else. So, straight away, they assumed the worst of Aisha, and it wasn't only an assumption, it was an accusation. It was a slander and a lie. So they spread that around. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prays to the believers that when they hear something like this, they don't believe it. They discount it completely. Whereas the ones who feed on this kind of thing, and they rejoice upon it, and they find an opportunity to talk. And by the way, this is a hidden desire. It's a hidden desire. We like to know about people's private life and talk about it. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ instructs us, he's saying, من حسل إسلام المرء تركه ما لا يعني. And by the way, this is, this is really a rule to live by. This is a rule to live by. It's a sign of a man's healthy faith that they leave matters that are none of their business. Matters that don't concern them. So people's private life doesn't concern you. People's haircuts don't concern you. They're none of your business. People's you know, dress code doesn't really concern you. People's personal things, they don't concern you. What this man said, what that woman said, what they did, where, where they were last month, where they traveled to, who their friends are, who their connections are, how they bought their house, how they did this. It's none of your business. Mind your own business. Mind your own business. So uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises the believers that when they hear such rumors, they think good about or they think well about their fellow um, uh, you know, Muslims. They think well about them. Uh, so th then we said Aisha received the news, the Prophet ﷺ received the news, and it was a source of great distress. And imagine Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu as well. Why, you, you know, uh, you know in, our, in our cultures, in our society, it's a huge thing to slander someone in their honor and their dignity. 
It's a huge thing. Like people would prefer death over you know their reputation being tarnished in such a way. So it was such a huge, and, and by the way, it really distracted the believers and the Muslim community from so many important obligations and other things. So the Muslim community at that time in Medina was completely consumed by this whole chaos that was created by this rumors. So you could actually destroy people's lives just by rumors, literally. People could go into, into states of depression by you just bullying them verbally and spreading rumors about them. Uh, you know, what happens even here in Toronto, uh, teenagers are taking their own lives because of what? Because of similar, similar slanders. People fabricating stories about them. And it happens. So it's a serious thing. It's a serious thing. And in Islam, if, if it's proven in the court that someone spread a rumor and that rumor led to someone actually taking their own life, these people are responsible. The murderers. The murderers. So it's not just, oh, I just said a word. Words are very powerful. So, so we promise to go over the verses quickly uh, and just take some lessons about how, uh, how, how, I mean, these instructions are extremely important in the, in the Muslim community. Let me actually just take a mushaf. <coughs> so this is in uh, this is in Surah An Nur. So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Adhu bilhamm shatan rajim." Inna aladina jaa'u bil ifki usbatum minkum la tahsabuhu sharra lakum bel huwa khayr lakum li kull mri'in minhum maktasab min al ithm wal ladhi tawalla kibrahu minhum lahu adab alazim. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says here first. That's verse number eleven. Those who brought about, those who created this slander, this whole rumor thing, they are a group from amongst you. They are, they are living among you, or you who believe. Now, look at the, I mean, the amount of stress and trauma that Aisha عنها, went through. The Prophet ﷺ himself went through. Abu Bakr and his wife went through. And the whole Muslim community. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لا تحسبوه شرا لكم بل هو خير لكم. Don't think it's bad for you. It's actually good for you. This actually helps us, or it invites us to be very careful about how we define situations. How we define situations. Because oftentimes, when things are unpleasant, when things are painful, automatically we classify them as bad for us. But life is much more complex than that. Actually, a lot of the trials, a lot of the hardships are actually good for you. So Allah is saying directly to the believers here, don't think it's bad for you, don't think it's evil, it's actually good for you. So this takes us to a very critical view on good and evil. We have to understand that our immediate definition, our immediate perception of situations as good or evil is very limited. In the grand scheme of things, what seems to be evil and painful could actually be good. And this gives us a lot of uh, space in life. Because we all go through adverse circumstances. We go through traumas. We don't have, if you don't believe in the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and, and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whatever he allows to happen, he has wisdom and mercy behind it, then you are actually limited by your ability to understand the situation. If it's painful, it's evil. And sometimes there are circumstances, circumstances could get overwhelming to the point you don't have any control, you don't have any choice, and they're quite traumatic. So we have another dimension where things could be interpreted. Things truly could be interpreted. And the Prophet ﷺ actually teaches us something about this. The Prophet ﷺ one day visited one of his companions. And this companion was going through an illness. And his illness was very severe, so he had fever, and he was suffering. The man, at some level, was hallucinating. The Prophet ﷺ goes and visits the man. When he sees the man, he says to the man, he says, إِنَّهَا رَحْمَةً What you're going through is a mercy. The man is going through pain. It's... Uh, severe disease, the man is having fever and he's suffering. The Prophet ﷺ says he's, it's mercy. This is a mercy. The Prophet ﷺ is giving him the deeper meaning of what you're going through. 
He looks at the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he says, humma tafur. He says, it's a boiling fever. He says, no, he says, it's a, it's a boiling fever. He's explaining his immediate reaction to it. It's a, it's a boiling fever. Ala shaykhin kabir, affecting an older person, a weak man. Tajurruhu ila al qubur. It's dragging him to the graves. What does the Prophet ﷺ say to him? فَهِيَ كَذَلِكَ Then it is what you talk about. It is how you take it. It is how you interpret it. It is how you interpret it. So things don't just happen to us. How we interpret what happens and how we respond to that has a powerful impact. Truly has a powerful impact. Again, in the famous hadith that we all know, the Prophet ﷺ describes this in more general terms. The Prophet ﷺ says, Ajaban li amri al mu'min, inna amrahu kullahu lahu khayr. Prophet ﷺ is saying, Amazing. He says, Amazing is the state of a believer. Everything that happens is actually, ends up being good for him or her. فَإِنْ أَصَابَتْهُ سَرَّاءَ شَكَرَ فَكَانَ خَيْرًا لَهُ If something good comes to him or comes to her, they are thankful and this is good for them. Prophet ﷺ is emphasizing the response, how they take it and how they respond. وَإِنْ أَصَابَتْهُ ضَرَّاءَ صَبَرَ فَكَانَ خَيْرًا لَهُ But if, if hardship, if harm, if pain comes to him or her, they are patient and this is good for them. That response makes it good for them. So it ends up, both ways, ends up working for you. And then the Prophet ﷺ says, وَلَيْسَ ذَلِكَ إِلَّا لِلْمُؤْمِنِ This is for no one but for a believer. Someone who truly believes in Allah because they know things don't happen randomly. Things have been planned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and whatever happens to you has deeper meanings. So if you arrive at those deeper meanings and embrace them, you empower yourself over a situation. So it's, in, in, it's important and the, the meanings that things ha that happen in our lives, the, their meanings are not arbitrary. They're not like, uh, I mean, they're not, there's no default. There's no default. Something like a suffering, you're going through suffering. If you see the point behind the suffering, if you see the, 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 the silver lining in the cloud, this is how things are going to turn out to be for you. So Allah gave us so much power in our lives, so much choice. Maybe the immediate thing is not what you want, but you can choose a good meaning. You can choose a good meaning for, for how things happen. And this is a source of a lot of power. This is a source of a lot of power. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, don't think it's bad, it's evil for you, it's actually good. It's actually good. So imagine such a suffering, Allah is saying it's actually good. It's actually good. And the Arab poet, he says, وَرُبَّمَا صَحَّةِ الْأَجْسَامُ بِالْعِلَلِ How often you get health, you get more healthy after you go through an illness. Because that illness challenges your body, it puts it under stress to the point that your body has to fight back to a point where your body ends up be being more healthy. And that's the whole point behind vaccination, right? Vaccination, they give a sort of a watered down version of the, of the germs to your body. So your body has to struggle and suffer and has to fight back so you build immunity. So you become actually end up being more healthy. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لِكُلِّ مِرِئٍ مِّنْهُمْ مَكْتَسَبَ مِنَ الْإِثْمِ For everyone who took part in this slander and in these rumors, everyone is going to get their share of the sin. وَالَّذِي تَوَلَّى كِبْرَهُ مِنْهُمْ لَهُ عَذَابٌ عَظِيمٌ And the person who originated that, the person who played the major role in that, which is Abdullah ibn Ubayy ibn Salul, he will have a great punishment. لَوْلَا إِذْ سَمِعْتُمُوهُ ظَنَّ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتُ بِأَنفُسِهِمْ خَيْرًا Allah is saying the believers should, when they heard that, they should have responded by thinking well about their fellow believers and they should say, this is a clear lie and slander. That should be the response. Then Allah SWT says, لَوْلَا جَاءُوا عَلَيْهِ بِأَرْبَعَةِ شُهَدَاءِ Here there is the legal, the, the legal part of it. So, you know, Islam also has ethics, has principles, but Islam pins them down by rules and regulations rules and regulations because this is how we have to live in this life so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says 
anyone who makes such an accusation of zina, it will not be accepted in Islam. And you guys should not accept it unless the person brings four witnesses. Four witnesses who have seen the acts so clearly. That's how Islam accepts it. If there is no four witnesses who have seen exactly what happened in clear detail, you cannot speak about it. You cannot speak about it. Let's say you see two people committing zina. You go and talk about this. In Islam, you have a punishment. You have slandered them. But they did it. You'll be punished. You can't speak about it. Unless what? You have four witnesses. Four witnesses who have seen the act exactly in detail. And you, you don't announce that. You don't air it. You take it to court. That's it. That's the only way of dealing with it. Acceptable in Islam. Apart from this, it's a slander. It's an act of slander. You speak about it, you will receive a punishment. That's how Islam protects society. And protects the honor of people. And even though you might say, but these people committed zina. Yes. But what you are doing by spreading that news might be worse than what they did. Because news spreading around is extremely dangerous. Then... Anyway, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about that this is all the gift or the, the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He protects you from the outcomes of what you say and what you do. Uh, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns us against a, a very serious act which is very common in society. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَتَقُولُونَ بِأَفْوَاهِكُمْ مَا لَيْسَ لَكُمْ بِهِ عِلْمٍ وَتَحْسَبُونَهُ هَيِّنًا وَهُوَ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ عَظِيمٌ This is a profound, profound, profound aspect of Islam and how it regulates, you know, the safety of society. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says how these people who ended up, you know, spreading that lie. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِذْ تَلَقَوْنَهُ بِأَلْسِنَتِكُمْ Allah says you receive it or you hear it with your tongues. What do we hear with? With our tongues? We hear with our ears, right? So normally, news goes through the ears, then it gets processed and filtered in your mind and in your heart before you, are, you speak about it or stay silent about it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, إِذْ تَلَقَوْنَهُ بِأَلْسِنَتِكُمْ You guys receive it with your tongues. What does that mean? You hear it, you, say, you speak it. You hear it? Oh, did you? Someone told, said you something straight away. You go on uh, what? WhatsApp someone. You text someone else. Or you go and speak to a group of friends and so on and so forth. So Allah is saying, and that's why the Prophet ﷺ says in the hadith, كَفَى بِالْمَرْءِ كَذِبًا أَنْ يُحَدِّثَ بِكُلِّ مَا سَمَعْ He says the Prophet ﷺ, sufficient for you to be a liar, sufficient for you to be a liar, that you say everything you hear. If you are someone who broadcasts everything that you receive, you're a liar. Automatically. You're a liar. Because a lot of what you hear is lying. A lot of what you hear is inaccurate. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is blaming those who spread the news. They just heard it and they spread it. Whereas the believer, if evil comes to you, if bad news comes to you, it lands on your ears and that's the, that's the end point. Nothing beyond that. Nothing beyond that. Last year, one of the Muslim figures, famous figures, you know, some, some of his affairs got exposed, right? On social media. He got exposed. Maybe he probably he had misdemeanors. He didn't act well, and so on and so forth. And what happens on social media? Almost everyone was just talking about it. People were blowing into it. And people were... Defending, so-called defending that brother or making them themselves judges over that brother, right? And what they ended up basically just spreading the news further, further and talking about it. That's why the scholars say, The way that you can kill evil talk is by not speaking it. Imagine with what happened last year about that brother, regardless. Now, we as individuals, we don't have access to know the reality of the situation. 
even if some people think, oh, it was clear, it was obvious. No, there's some tri sometimes details about a situation that really change the whole context. Imagine if that news spread by one person on their account on Facebook, that's what happened, and the others implemented this verse. They implemented this verse. So these two verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, as you receive it with your tongues, then you say and you speak that which you have no knowledge about, you don't have proper knowledge about, right? You just heard it. Knowledge comes from verification. Knowledge comes, comes from knowing the whole, the totality of the situation and the context and everything that has to do with it. وَتَحْسَبُونَهُ هَيِّنَا And you think it's, it's just uh, it's a matter, it's just a light matter, it's not a big deal. وَهُوَ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ عَظِيمٌ But with Allah, it's a, it's a very huge thing. It's, with Allah, it's a very grave, serious matter. وَلَوْلَا إِذْ سَمِعْتُمُوهُ قُلْتُمْ مَا يَكُونُ لَنَا أَنْ نَتَكَلَّمَ بِهَذَا سُبْحَانَكَ هَذَا بُهْتَانٌ عَظِيمٌ You should have, the moment you heard about this, you should have said, Oh Allah, all glory belongs to you, we should not speak about this. Oh Allah, you know that this is a clear lie. That's it. This should be your response. I'm not going to get myself involved in it. So imagine the Muslims last year when that news spread around, Imagine every Muslim acted upon this. What would, have done? what would have happened? I just want you to imagine how many sins Muslims gain just by talking about the situation. People who have nothing to do with it. Probably I would guess millions and millions and millions, millions of times the story was retold on social media. Right? Now, about a year later or even more, what have we gained from that? Those who spoke about it, what have they gained from it? What have they gained? The thing is, all those records, they will be played out in front of them on the Day of Judgment, right? Is that going to be in their favor? So again, and now there is, uh, somebody told me about the hashtag, uh, me too, right? You know, <laughs> me too. And people are going around on that hashtag claiming to be victims of sexual, sexual assault, right? And this slander, so some people are using it to slander others, to fabricate stories about others, right? In order to assassinate characters. Imagine. So, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is instructing us how do you deal with news when it's being spread around? When you hear something about your brother, when you hear something about your sister, when you hear something about uh, a public figure in the Muslim community, when you hear about something about a politician as well, why do you need to spread the news? So and so, he was found guilty of this and that. You know those who are old enough, uh, what was that? Uh, you know, Bill Clinton, what was the lady's name? Lewinsky. Monica Lewinsky? Yeah. What did we gain of all of this? Who benefited from all of this but the politicians, right? Slanders. 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 Somebody might say, oh, he deserves it, he deserves it. But you don't want to be part of this process. You don't want to be part of this process. So this is why the Prophet ﷺ says, مَنْ كَانَ يُؤْمِنُ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ فَلْيَقُلْ خَيْرًا أَوْ لِيَصْمُتْ Whoever believes in Allah and the last day, let them say that which is good or remain silent. Again, the uh, other hadith where the Prophet ﷺ says, وَهَلْ يَكُبُّ النَّاسَ فِي النَّارِ عَلَى مَنَاخِرِهِمْ إِلَّا حَصَائِدُ أَلْسِنَتِهِمْ He says, what else throws people in the hellfire on their faces but the outcomes of their tongues? The outcomes of their tongues. You see how powerful a tongue is? How powerful a tongue is? You might just be having a conversation with a brother. You know, I remember, uh, honestly, like I, 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 I was, when I was young, I was probably 20 years old, and in university, I had this friend. But I hadn't seen him for a while. And then someone says, oh no, he has this. You know, this girl and this and that. And I heard about that. And I said, wow, why, why would you do something like this? Then, okay, I thought innocently, innocently, I said that to a couple of brothers. And I said, do you believe this is the case? How people change. And I left it at that. 
Okay, I left it in that. And then probably a few months later, maybe four or five months later, one of our common friends comes to me and he says, why, do you, why did you say something like this? I said, what? He said, you said this and that. I said, well, I heard someone else say it. And I thought everyone knew about it. He said, no. Now everyone is talking about it. And where did it come from? It came from you. One person made that lie up in front of me. I swallowed it. I, I, I received it on my tongue. And I, and I just thought innocently, I spoke you know, to two of our friends about it. Those people didn't save any effort spreading it around. And it reached that brother that he was upset with me. Why would I create such a lie against him? And I really felt bad about that. I couldn't even reach him to apologize, etc. But I learned my lesson. If it's none of your business, why do you get into it? Why do you have to talk about it? Why, why do you feel compelled to speak about something that doesn't bring you closer to Allah? Why? Why would you say something that doesn't bring you a legitimate worldly benefit? Why? What would you gain from that? It's shaitan. It is shaitan. So imagine if we Muslims just abide by this, just live by this. You hear something bad about a brother or a sister or about a random person. Muslim and Muslim doesn't make any difference. You just don't talk about it. Just don't talk about it. Don't, you know, post about it on Twitter or, or, or Instagram or any social media, any platform. Don't, just let, let it die. Let it die out. You would find much more peace in your life. Your heart would be much cleaner, more healthier. And the community or the society would be much more you know, tight-knit and much more healthy. So these are important things. So the instructions of the Prophet Wasallam add them to this story. You see, there's nothing random in Islam. Obligations in Islam are not just for the sake of giving you orders and placing borders around you and making restrictions. It's not. Everything in Islam that says, don't do it, there is a serious matter behind it. There is, whether you see it or not. So just trust Allah's wisdom and abide by it. So, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then he says, يَعِذُكُمُ اللَّهُ أَن تَعُودُوا لِمِثْلِهِ أَبَدًا إِن كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns you against going back to something similar if you are truly believers. So that shows that if you truly believe, you should keep away from, you know, tail carrying, backbiting, or just speaking about everything you hear. Anyway, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ Later on, in Allah, in the Ladina Yuhibuna, and Tashi al Fahisha to fill the Dina Aman Ulahum Adabun Alimun fit Dunya, well Akhira, Wallahu, Wallahu Yalamu and Tumla Talamun. Those who love for Fahisha, for sin, spe specifically sins that are linked to uh, sexuality, those who love for that to spread among the believers, these people will have a severe punishment on the Day of Judgment. So why is Allah mentioning this? Those who spread sin among the believers. Because by spreading rumors, you spread sins. By spreading rumors, you spread sins. By the way, I know that sometimes there are certain random incidents that happened of an attack against a Muslim, right? Here or there, a brother or a sister or a family, etc. And I know the importance of creating awareness about this, but sometimes that backfires. Because when you keep airing and posting about incidents attacks like this there's always the danger of normalizing them there's a danger of normalizing them. the more you post about these things the more people see these happen people who are on the border they might actually develop the courage to engage in these acts of, of attack of aggression so we need to see both sides we need to be careful this is why in Islam we don't talk about evil things in detail we don't talk about evil things in detail, but good things we talk about them in detail. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, just talking about, even talking about a sin, that some people did a sin, you actually normalize it for others. You normalize it for others. So this is one reason why Islam encourages what we call a setr, that you don't expose people, even people who sin. You don't, don't talk about them publicly. You don't talk about them publicly. 
Why? Because it just encourages people to fall more into them. You might be saying, oh, I'm just raising awareness. I'm telling people this is not a good thing to do. But, you know, people are not completely objective. People have a desire when they see something happening, they actually, it makes it easier for them to do it and engage in it, for some of them. So human behavior is not always so predictable. It's not always so predictable. Anyway. So, so this is what happened. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the verses explaining the clearing Aisha radiallahu anha and uh, removing this predicament from the life of the Prophet We said three of the companions were found guilty of this. Why? Because they just spoke about that directly. They didn't use insinuation. They actually used the word zina, something like this, to that effect. They didn't create any insinuation. They didn't imply anything indirectly. They said it clearly. So what happened? These people received the punishment for, what, what is it called? Uh, when you slander people like this, when you accuse, qadf. Qadf is just like, qadf is, is, is actually for shooting. Like when you, when, you, when you throw a huge thing on something, this is called qadf. So basically, it's a very severe act when you speak against the honor of someone. It's called qadf. You have shot at them. You have shot at them. It's such a huge thing in Islam. So these three companions, Hamna bin Tujahsh, sister of Zainab bin Tujahsh, uh, Mistah ibn Uthatha, and Hassan ibn Thabit. They were lashed. They were lashed, three of them, for engaging in that based on the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because Allah started the surah by saying those that make accusations against innocent people, they should be lashed 80 times without bringing four witnesses. Even if it happened, even if it happened, without four witnesses, that's it. So, so, so again, you see there's a lot of lessons about how to handle you know, these social issues and it's important. There's a, there's a safety net here for protecting the honor of people. Because by the way, people can put up with physical pain, but emotional and mental pain is much more severe. Is much more severe. So, so these things are taken into account. And this is why you find in Islam what we call the maqasid of, sh of sharia, the, the main objectives of Islam, the main objectives of, of Whole, whole of Islamic legislation from among them is protecting the honor and the dignity of people. Hifdul <laughs> that you protect the dignity and honor of people. Because if you say about someone, he did this or she did that, that's a huge attack. It's a source of a lot of emotional pain to that person. And people commit suicide for that. People's lives are destroyed. People fall in depression just for that. So Islam takes care of all of this. And it, it places around legislations to protect the society and the individual society against this. Anyway, so Mustah ibn Athatha was the cousin of Abu Bakr. Anhu. Abu Bakr, when he realized, okay, he got involved in this, he was a poor person. Abu Bakr was rich, a rich person. He used to you know, support this man financially, his cousin. He used to support his cousin financially. When he realized he was involved in this and Allah cleared the whole issue, he said, I'm not going to spend on you. I've been looking after you and now you slander my daughter. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals uh, in the same group of verses, So Allah is saying, and that those who have been helping out, those who have been, you know, good or extending favors to others, speaking about Abu Bakr, let them not hold back from helping those people. And let them forgive and pardon. Don't you love that Allah forgives you? That means if you want Allah to forgive you, forgive people. And you forgive people who wrong you. You don't forgive people for nothing. People have really wronged you, hurt you. These are the people that you should forgive. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives you in return. And Allah is often, often forgiving and merciful. So when Abu Bakr hears this, the verse 
Don't you love that Allah forgives you? Allah says, Don't you love that Allah forgives you? Abu Bakr, he says, yes, indeed. Oh Allah, I love that you forgive me. So then he went back to support that man financially again. And that's the role of faith. It supersedes personal issues. That although this person slandered my daughter and I had been helping him out all of these years, and this is how he pays me back, yet I'm still gonna, if Allah loves that I spend on him, I'm just gonna spend on him. That's surrender, that's submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not saying, if I like it, I'll do it. If I don't like it, I won't do it. No, they respond. They say, we hear and we obey. So he wants the forgiveness of Allah, so he pay, still supports that man financially after, afterwards. Uh, this uh, military expedition, Ghazwat bin al-Mustalaq, we said bin al-Mustalaq lived closer to Mecca. When Quraysh hear about this, like, now they're saying, oh, Muhammad is just getting more powerful. <laughs> Instead of Muhammad having a setback in Uhud, Muhammad is getting more powerful. He's actually marching out of Medina, reaching to these Arab tribes. Whoever poses a threat on him, he's, he's able to uh, diffuse that kind of threat. He's taking initiative. So they're getting more worried about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Really, they're getting really worried. So what happens after this? The Prophet ﷺ still sends military expeditions around to prove his presence. So you can see the Prophet ﷺ was acting on so many levels. So he was keeping everyone else under watch. The Prophet ﷺ was building a Muslim society in Medina, even after the setback of Uhud. And the Prophet ﷺ was making sure that he diffuses and aborts all threats before they develop into a critical point. Uh, The Prophet ﷺ sends uh, Abu Ubaidah Amr bin al-Jarrah uh, with 300 of the companions towards the Red Sea. Towards the Red Sea. So from Medina towards the Red Sea. This is not Jeddah, north of Jeddah. It's going to be north of Jeddah. Why? Because this is the trade caravans routes. This is where the caravans of Quraysh go to Asham, to north of the Arabian Peninsula. The Prophet ﷺ wants to dominate that area and send a message, you know, we're not some people who are hiding in Medina, okay? We're gonna exercise our power, we're expanding, we're just getting stronger. Sending these impressions is extremely important. Extremely important. And this is about really, it's about human entities now. And this is important for communities here. As a Muslim community, we are sending a message to other communities here in, in the Canadian society, by the way. And these impressions are extremely important. Sometimes they're not accurate because there are cultural gaps. Sometimes we behave in a way that is completely innocent but is sending a wrong message to another community. And it causes friction and miscommunication. So we have to be aware of this. The Prophet ﷺ was aware of what impression the Muslim entity was sending outward was very careful this is why when he was uh, advised on how to deal with the hypocrites and you see the kind of damage that they are able of doing and we mentioned last week that the ansar awsan al khazraj actually yeah the ansar awsan al khazraj were about to fight among themselves right when the prophet said who you know, who will deal with this person who's slandering my family and we had sa'd ibn ubadah and sa'd ibn mu'ad right and they almost got to the point of Al-Khazraj and Al-Aws fighting among each other. So it was such a huge threat. So the Prophet was advised by some of his companions, why don't you just, you know, execute them, get rid of them. The Prophet said, لا يحدث الناس أن محمد يقتل أصحابه. I don't want other tribes and other people to be under the impression that Muhammad is killing his companions. Because they don't know about hypocrisy or hypocrites. They think these are all companions of Muhammad. Why is he killing some of them? So the Prophet ﷺ was very aware of the kind of impression that he's sending outward. Because that's extremely important. And we have to be, again, very aware of what kind of impressions that are being sent outward. These are extremely important things. Because this is how people function. This is how people are going to treat you. So the Prophet ﷺ was sending a very strong impression, again, outward that... We are strong enough. We are dominating this piece of land. Don't mess with us. And this could actually, and this is what they call psychological warfare. It actually, if there's a 
if there are people who have some kind of plans or intentions to attack you uh, or to come and invade Medina, they would actually think a thousand times before taking that step. Because you're demonstrating so much power. You're, demonstrating, you're creating an impression. So the Prophet was very careful about this. So he sent uh, Ubaidah Amr bin Jarrah with 300 companions towards to the west, yes, to the west of Medina, towards the Red Sea, to sort of scan that area and prove presence. So they go there, and this was a time of a lot of lack among the Muslims. These 300 companions, the Prophet provided them with what? A huge sack of dates. That's the only provision they had. had. So Abu Ubaid Amr al Jarrah had to manage this very well. How did he manage it? He used to give each one of them one date a day. One date a day. So uh, Jabir ibn Abdullah radiallahu anhu, he was among this group. So he says, he used to give us a date. And the way we ate it was we would suck on it for half a day <laughs> in order to survive just. So enjoy it to the fullest and keep it with us as much as possible. And then we would drink water. So that's all we had a day until they reached a point where they ran out of everything. So with them was Sa'd ibn Ubadah, the great companion from the Ansar. Sa'd ibn Ubadah was with his son Qais. When he sees this, it's hard for the Muslims and they are actually in the desert and they're traveling. So he decides to spend from his own money. So they pass by some people, he buys camels and he slaughters the camels for the Muslims to eat. So each day he slaughters three camels. Three camels then... Uh, some of the camels actually the Muslims were riding were from Sa'd himself. So he starts to slaughter some of these. Then Abu Ubaidah being the leader, he sees, he foresees that there's going to be troublesome because we're going to run out of, we're going to kill the camels that we have. We can't, you know, just go on foot back to Medina. It doesn't work. So he says to Sa'd Ubaidah, enough, enough. So they were really struggling with food until they reach the Red Sea. When they reach the Red Sea, they see something they've never seen in their, they had never seen in their life. What was that? A whale. A dead whale on the side, on the shore. <laughs> Huge, massive whale on the side. The Arabs know nothing about sea life, by the way. Especially at that time, they had no knowledge. They actually hated the sea and they, they were extremely scared of sailing. So when they saw the whale, they checked it out and they realized it was a whale and it was dead. It was dead. So they thought, we're hungry. Shall we eat it? It was still fresh. Shall we eat from it? Or so then they thought to themselves, but it's dead and we're not supposed to eat dead animals. Like we're not supposed to eat dead animals. And they didn't know about the ruling. So the Prophet was asked, سُئِلَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ عَنِ الْبَحْرِ The Prophet was asked about the ocean, about the sea. فَقَالْ هُوَ أَطَّهُورُ مَاؤُهُ الْحِلُّ مَيْتَتُهُ About the sea, its water is tahur. You can, you can use it for wudu. It's pure and you can use it for wudu. And the dead animals of the sea can be eaten. Not like sheep and goat and camels you have to slaughter them if they are dead you can eat them from if it's from the sea you don't have to slaughter have you slaughtered fish have you seen like halal fish <laughs> like anything from the sea if it's dead you can eat it obviously it's going to die once you get it out you, so there's no slaughter so that's an exception but they didn't know about that so they thought to, they they said we can't eat it because it's it's a dead animal what did Abu Ubaidah say? He used ijtihad. He used his mind now to think. He says, let me actually uh, mention his exact words. <coughs> okay. So they said, it's a dead animal. So he said, Abu Ubaidah, he said, بَلْ نَحْنُ رُسُلُ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه We are dispatched by the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم وقد وفي سبيل الله we are on the path of Allah we're doing something for the sake of Allah وقد اضطررتم and you are in a position of necessity we don't have food 
And when we are in a position as in the Quran, إِلَّا مَنِ الضُّرَّةِ Except for those who are in a state of necessity, you can eat dead animals. It says we are in a state of need. So we're going to eat it, even if it's dead. Even if it's dead. So they actually camp there for two weeks. And they eat from it. They eat from it. A huge whale. Okay? Now, the eye cavity of the, of the whale... So they kept eating, eating from it until uh, like most of it remained as bone. So they said, we actually put on weight in these two weeks. We put on weight and we used the oil of the whale to, uh, to medicate our skin as a um, lotion, moisturizer. Okay. So they said, we, we put on weight and we became extremely healthy. Extremely healthy. They said... 13 of us could, si could sit in the eye cavity of that whale. This is how huge it is. One of its ribs it said, the tallest among us would stand on the back of a camel and would be able to pass under the rib of that whale. That's how huge it was. So they camped there for two weeks. Obviously, people started hearing about the Muslims are camped here and they're moving around and they're dominating this area and so on and so forth. They said, that's enough. We did what we fulfilled the mission. Let's go back. Let's go back. Some, some of you might think, oh, you know, 15 days, it must have gone bad. Like the, obviously, like it's the heat, the heat of the Arabian Peninsula must have gone bad. But, you know, the, the Arabs at the time were extremely very uh, apt at... Uh, Preserving food, preserving food. So they would salt it or they would smoke it to preserve it, right? So apparently it seems that that's what they did to the point that they took some of its meat even with them to Medina. So they went back, when they went back to Medina, they told the Prophet ﷺ about it and he said, you should have, you know, kept something for me. <laughs> they said, we actually kept and they gave the Prophet ﷺ some of it and he ate from it. And he ate from it. So nobody said, but it's dead, right? But we know the ruling, right? Fish, it doesn't have to be slaughtered. It's dead. You can eat it even if it's, even if it's dead. So, now every, people around are getting worried about the Muslims making all these moves. Quraysh is worried, concerned. Qatafan, huge tribes also concerned. My, many of the other smaller tribes are concerned. And who else? You know, the ones who were exiled from Medina. Banu Nadir. The Jewish tribe of Ben Nadir, they moved to Khaybar. And we said we're going to come back to this. Like they moved to Khaybar, they, be, they dominated Khaybar. They became the leaders of Khaybar. Who among them was? Huyay ibn Akhtab. Huyay ibn Akhtab was one of their main, main leaders. So they decided the Muslims are growing bigger and stronger. We need to put a limit to this. So they start putting a plan. Some people start making some moves, speaking to others, making visits here and there in order to deal with the Muslims once and for all. Get rid of the Muslims completely. Who led this? The one who led that was Huyay ibn Akhtab uh, and others from Banu Nadir. Uh, Salam ibn Abi al-Huqayq. So two main people, Huyay ibn Akhtab and Salam ibn Abi al-Huqayq. They are from Banu Nadir, they had moved to, they were exiled from Medina, so they moved to Khaybar, and that's where they established themselves again. And they wanted to take it back on the Prophet ﷺ and get rid of the Muslims. So first they speak to Quraysh. So they go to Mecca and they hold talks with the leaders of Quraysh. So they want to come up with a plan because they saw that the Muslims are able to deal with any army that deals with them face to face. So now they want to resort to a different strategy. So what is the strategy they're putting together? Inshallah we're going to deal with this next week. Bi-idhnillahi. Uh, just a reminder, I was told of a very important thing actually by, so you know, Sheikh Qasim is going to start holding some, uh, it's, it's actually a beautiful wo workshop, monthly workshop is going to take place on Mondays and Wednesdays from Maghrib to Isha. Mondays and Wednesdays between Maghrib and Isha, a limit of 10 people. Sheikh Qasim is going to take a, each time a group of 10 people and they're going to go over Surah Al-Fatiha in terms of proper recitation because sometimes people recite Al-Fatiha, they don't recite it properly. It's important for the validity of your Salah that you recite it well. 
is gonna over again gonna go over uh, the last three surahs of the Quran. So each intake is ten people only. Uh, so this is gonna happen. I think I'm, I'm probably next month. I'm not sure, but the details you can ask in the main office about the details and for registration. So and obviously Sheikh Qasim is a Qari and he's someone who can really I mean, mashallah, he's got a good way of helping you get the pronunciation right. It's important to get the pronunciation specifically of the Fatiha right. So I advise everyone to actually seek that. Uh, each time there will be a new intake of ten people. So keep an eye on this, inshallah. And take advantage of this. And today we have a potluck, right? Hopefully, you know, uh, you didn't come uh, empty-handed. <laughs> okay, we can take uh, two questions. Yes. Salamatullah. Taghafal, okay. Yes. Taghafal means to play dumb. Overlook. Overlook. Now, yesterday I read a story about beautiful story. It's a real story, and it's of uh, uh, a supervisor in a company that was doing very well. It's a small company, and this supervisor was the main guy there. He was doing very well. He said, "I had a playful employee, but he was extremely intelligent, and he did his work. But he would miss some meetings. He would call in sick sometimes. He would." It would not be consistent with his like timings, and uh, he used to take extra vacation. But he got the work done, and he did more than expected. He said, "But I wanted to play manager, so I started cornering him and making sure that he's on time and things like that." So he says, one day, he asks for vacation, and I know he wants to go with his friends somewhere. So I say, no. He says, I want to play manager, right? I want to play by the rules. I'm not doing anything wrong. She says, no. And he says, I know he has plans. So I says, no. So he, he sends, he calls in sick. And he doesn't come to, the com to, the, to work that day. So he says, I make sure I was ready. I go home to visit him. Right, being smart. Being smart, right? I want to go and visit him and just make sure he's okay. Okay, you're, you're calling in sick. I just came to check on you. So he comes, he finds him preparing his stuff in the car to go on a vacation for a couple of days. He says, okay, you're sick, right? So he catches him. He goes and he obviously makes a deduction, a penalty on him. And uh, he says, I thought I was, you know, being good manager, I was doing my work. And I, I, I caught him. I didn't want him to lie to me, I didn't want him to mess around. So he says at the end of the month, he hands in his resignation. He hands in his resignation. And he gets a job with the main competitor of this company. And he ends up being a great advantage to the competitor. We lost a lot of business. And the business went down, profit margins went down. A lot of the team members really, because he was a connector in the team. We lost a very important element. He said, why? Because of me not being able to overlook some mistakes. Again, that's the ghafl. So the Prophet ﷺ would see some mistakes from people, see some weaknesses, but he would, you don't have to be precise. Some people, they love it when they catch you doing something wrong. They love it when you miss, miss up something. They, they love it. And these are the people, and I think we mentioned that uh, uh, last week, about... You know, not chasing people as a leader, as a Muslim governor, not chasing people for their mistakes. We're not supposed to go and chase people for their mistakes. You should overlook, overlook. The Prophet ﷺ mainly overlooked. So this is a very important aspect of, of uh, you know, human interaction. Overlook, overlook. Sometimes it, it, it's not a good thing. It's not a good strategy. If you're going to be taken advantage of, obviously, then you need to be decisive here. So, but you use your judgment. And, you know, refine that judgment to be able to see where you draw the line. But taghafal, overlooking mistakes and shortcomings sometimes, it's a very good strategy. You see? Yeah. So that's what it means, taghafal. Barakallah. Yeah. Well, that's an issue of debate. It's a good question. So there are animals that live both 
in the ocean and outside what do you call them in english amphibians yeah amphibians in arabic barmaiyat amphibians right are they part of this or not that's a dispute among the scholars that's a dispute but some of them they said uh, depending on where it spends most of its time Mo when it's where it spends most of its time so for example turtles ocean turtles they say well that's that's included in the in the fish type of category and so on and so forth yes Okay, we're done with questions. Jazakum la khair. See you next week. Inshallah, enjoy the potluck. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sallam. By the way, uh, not this Sunday. Next Sunday, we have a workshop. And I'm telling you, it's extremely important for parents. Extremely important. This sister who's doing this is actually an expert. She really knows what she's talking about. She's involved in the community. And don't worry, she's not going to be visible for the brothers. So she will speak to the sisters. The brothers will be on the side, but you will be able to see slides. It's going to be interactive, but it's extremely important. What she shares is extremely important. So I really uh, uh, advise everyone to register for this and take part in that and benefit from it. Jazakumullah khair. We're going to have more, inshallah. Almost every month, bi'idhnillah, we're going to have more workshops, for people from different fields, inshallah, because subhanAllah, in our community, we have a lot of assets. We want to bring that and give them platform, inshallah, and share the benefit. Jazakumullah khair.